Well, yesterday, after work, around 5.15 p.m., I wasn't expecting to be here at all. I got a phone call from my brother, Roger, um, and he said that a pastor was going to contact him because he needed someone to, to bring the word this morning to Kendall Church. So I was like, okay. <laughs> so I'll wait for his phone call, and they did call me up, and I, I did agree to come. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm very happy. I'm blessed. Um, who, for those who know me, um, uh, I know Gerson knows me very well. Uh, I really do enjoy this. I enjoy um, teaching God's Word. Uh, I have a passion for teaching God's Word. I believe that the bedrock of every great found, uh, reformation uh, is based on God's Word. You can find that throughout Scripture. Okay. Uh, and even Jesus, when he was here, walking amongst us, um, some people might say that his ministry uh, was not so wordy, was not so much into Scripture, but they're completely wrong. He only, he only used Scripture. And if you look at who he was, according uh, to John, he was the Alpha and the Omega. And the Alpha and Omega, simply in the Greek, means he was the letter A, and the letter Z. So between the letter A and the letter Z, what you have are letters. And with the letters, you form words. And words are the expressions of your thoughts. So when you think about, I'm hungry, you say, I'm hungry, right? So when Jesus was here, he was the living, walking, in the flesh, expression of God's thoughts amongst men so he is the word so every great reformation don't let anyone tell you contrary every great reformation starts here in God's word okay so today's subject the revelation of Jesus this is part of a series that I prepared um, for our Bible class at Miami Temple. It's a series based on the book of Revelation. I tried to simpl simplify as much as possible the book of Revelation. And one of the topics that I have in this series is called, Who Are the 144,000? Okay? So let's pray very quickly. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this opportunity to open your word. I pray that at this moment that your Holy Spirit may speak. I'm just a man, Lord. I'm just a tool, an instrument. I pray that you may empty, empty me of anything that can interfere with this message and fill me with your Holy Spirit and hide me behind the cross in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, the 144,000 is a subject that many people kind of run away from. Okay, it's not an easy subject. It's not easy to teach, um, but it's there. It's in the book of Revelation, so that means that it's meant for us to study it. Now, I do not um, consider myself an expert in the subject. I'm still learning. I'm going to consider myself a student of God's Word until I stop breathing. So we're always learning. We're always learning something new in God's Word. Um, so who are the 144,000? And the clicker didn't work. Am I doing it right? There we go. <laughs> so, I have a few questions here. Is it possible to find a message of hope in a study like the 144,000? You should ask yourself that. Is it, I mean, is there something there that I can gain from this? How does this help me deal with my problems? We're in here, we're here at church this morning, and sometimes we come here and we, and we want to hear a message that's going to go directly uh, and address my problem, my issues this morning. So how does this study help me with that? And what can I gain from today's message? Okay, is there something that I can gain? I believe there's always something you can gain from studying God's Word, from studying prophecy. Okay, now, what does the spirit of prophecy say? And I'm going to read this, and I want you guys to understand why I'm, I have this quote from Ellen White. It says here, it is not his will that they shall get into controversy over questions which will not help them spiritually, such as who is to compose the 144,000. This, those who are the elect of God, will in short time know without question. My brethren and sisters, 
appreciate and study the truths God has given for you and your children. Spend not your time in seeking to know that which will be no spiritual help. What shall I, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? This is the all-important question, and, and it has been clearly answered. What is written in the law, and how readeth thou? Okay? So, um, sometimes we kind of we get this quote from Ellen White, and we say, well, maybe she's saying we shouldn't even study this subject. We should kind of stay away from this subject. Okay, it's not a point of salvation, all right? That's not what she was saying. She was addressing a specific uh, situation at that time with a specific church, and she was addressing the controversy that was happening within that congregation because of subjects like this. We shouldn't be debating with each other about these kinds of subjects. We should be learning from each other and kind of building on each other's understanding of subjects like this to edify the church, not to break it down or to break it apart, okay? So, should we ignore the subject of the 144,000? What do you think? Yeah. Okay, you should ignore it. <laughs> it says, what do I gain from studying prophecies? Blessed is he that what? Yeah. That readeth, right? And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Okay, for the time is at hand. So, whoever studies this subject, and it's in the book of Revelation, and it pops up more than you think, in the book of Revelation, it says that when you study and you apply it, you understand it, okay, you accept it, it becomes a blessing in your life. God's word is a blessing, okay? Now, what are the identifying marks of the 144,000? Let's start from here, because if we start from here and we look at these identifying marks, it's going to help us better understand this subject, okay? Okay, there we go. All right, so it says in Revelation 7, uh, chapter 7, verses 2 to 4, they have the seal of God on their foreheads. I'm going to read through the list so that way I don't take up too much time. It says also, they have the name of the Father and Son written on their foreheads. They have kept themselves as pure as virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They have been purchased from among the people of earth as a special offering to God and to the Lamb. They have told no lies and are blameless before God's throne. They are wearing white robes washed with the blood of the Lamb. They have come from a great tribulation, and it says that they stand before God's throne and serve Him day and night. These are not seasonal Christians. These Christians are bearing fruit all year long law, okay? So, it, this is the list, okay, that you find in the book of Revelations that helps you identify the characteristics of this group, which is very, very important, okay? And I have all the references there. Um, if you would like these slides, um, I can give it to you. I can send it to your email. Just, uh, just talk to me after the presentation, okay? So, what did John see them doing as they stood before the throne of God? Okay, so he sees this vision and he sees the 144,000 and they're doing something interesting, okay? In Revelation chapter 14, verse 3, it says, And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn this song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. So they're singing this new song. So the question is, what song are they singing? Okay, what song are they singing? So we go here to the next uh, uh, text in Revelation 15, verse 3, okay, and it says, and they sang the song of who? Moses. Of Moses. They sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the, Almi the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. So they're singing this song, okay? This is the song of Moses and the Lamb. Now, what makes this song so important? Why is this song identified as the song of Moses and the Lamb? Okay? That's the question we should ask, right? So, 
When you go to Revelation 14, verse 12, this is one of the characteristics that was on the list. It says, okay, here is the pers perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. So we look at this song. It represents an experience that this group has before the second coming of Jesus. And it says that they have these identifying marks, okay? They sing the song of Moses because Moses, he represents the law. He's the lawgiver, okay? Then you go into the New Testament, and then you have uh, Jesus, who is the one who gave his life, shed his blood, okay? And now we are saved by grace, okay? A grace that has always existed because the gospel is called an everlasting gospel, okay? So there was never a moment in time, at least for God's people, where they were not saved by grace, but this was solidified through the, through the sacrifice of Jesus. So these are the characteristics of this group, law and grace, but this you can take a little bit deeper, okay? You can go a little bit further into this characteristic, why this song is called the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb, okay? So, Moses and the Lamb also commemorate the most significant events found in the Old and New Testament, okay? When you go into the Old Testament, you have the story of God's people. They're in bondage, they're in Egypt, and Moses, he comes as their liberator. And he takes them out of Egypt through the power of God, okay? And then you have Jesus in the New Testament. We are under the bondage of sin, and Jesus, he is our liberator. You have the beginning here of both churches in the Old and the New Testament, starting with Moses. If you talk to someone of a Jewish background, Okay, this is the most significant story for them because this is a mark that identifies them as Jews. The fact that they were in bondage in Egypt, were liberated. In fact, the Passover is the, probably the most important okay, um, celebration that they have due to the fact that through that celebration, this is how they identify themselves as a people. Okay, because of that experience. And of course, us as Christians, we look at what Jesus did on the cross. He gave his life for us. He shed his blood. He resurrected. And we are saved through Christ's merits. Okay, so this is why you have this song of Moses and the Lamb, because it represents a very, very special moment. It represents an experience that God's people and only God's people could have when they accept Jesus as their Savior. Okay? Now, are the 144,000 literal or symbolic? Or maybe a little bit of both. Who knows? This is the question. This is usually where we hit a dead end, okay? Because this is where the controversy begins. This is where everyone begins to kind of debate against each other in, in terms of, okay, is this group literal? Is it literally 144,000? Is this number a symbolic number that represents a literal group of people that exist? Okay, if uh, you have spoken or if you have ever spoken to someone, for example, that is a Jehovah's Witness, okay? I have a coworker that's a, that's a Jehovah's Witness, all right? And he kind of challenged me on this subject because they believe themselves to be the 144,000. In fact, when they have communion, they pass the bread and the wine around, but no one can eat the bread and no one can drink the wine. Only the 144,000 amongst them. Okay? So I asked them, how do you know who's the 144,000? Oh, they just know it. They just feel it. But I said, man, but I feel like I'm part of that group. So how do you answer that? And do you have a list somewhere in your conference at your headquarters where it says, well, brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so are part of the 144,000? Because for them, once this number is completed, literally, that's where the Armageddon begins. Okay? So if you have ever spoken to them and if, if you have ever studied their material, which I have, because I gave Bible to a Jehovah's Witness once, so I had to study their material before I spoke to him. Um, you're gonna find all that information in there, okay? So, are they right? Okay, are we wrong? Okay, so, how many were sealed from each tribe? So let's start from here. Let's try to answer that question starting from here. How many were sealed 
from each tribe, okay? So if you go to Revelation chapter 7, verses 4 to 8, you have the list uh, of the tribes of Israel, okay? And it begins with Judah and it ends with Benjamin, okay? And then you have Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, uh, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, and Joseph, okay? 12,000 of each of these tribes are sealed. Now, this should raise some red flags in terms of the literal interpretation of this group. Because then you start to tread into dangerous waters, something called predestination, which we don't believe in. Okay? It's not biblical. Meaning that God somewhere in eternity chose you to be saved and chose the guy outside the church not to be saved. Okay? And the reason why I say that is because how could 12,000 exactly from each tribe be sealed? Wouldn't it, be, would it, it make more sense if it was 12,198 for one, 11,900, okay? Do you get my drift? Do you get my point? Okay? So you have these 12,000 from each tribe that are sealed. Now, I have some information here, but I think, I think that history is very important. I don't think history should determine how we interpret Scripture, but I think that a lot of information in history helps us to understand the background of what was going on during that time and when John wrote this and when he was inspired and so forth. So in 922 BC, during the reign of King Rehoboam, the northern tribes of Israel revolted and formed the kingdom of Israel. Remember the story? To the north with Samaria as its capital. The remaining tribes in the south, which were Judah, Judah and Benjamin, became the Judean kingdom with Jerusalem as its capital. Okay, now, for 200 years, the Hebrew kingdoms would remain divided, and for most of that time, they were fighting each other. Okay? Now, in 722 BC, the kingdom of Israel was conquered by the Assyrians and were scattered throughout the Assyrian territory. This was done in order to maintain conquered lands pacified. So they would split everybody up. They didn't want you guys getting together and forming an army and taking over again. So they would say, well, you know what, let's split up these people, okay? So this is what they did. The Assyrians were also sent to occupy conquered lands who usually adopted local beliefs and gods to avoid divine retribution, okay? From this scattering, when you get to the time of Jesus, this is why you have the synagogues, because the center of religion for the Jews was the temple. But because they were scattered, they didn't have access to the temple, so they began to set up synagogues as centers of worship and study of God's word for the community, for the Jewish community at that location, okay? So that's why when you get to the time of Jesus, you have all these synagogues, okay? Now, the scattered Hebrews do not remain unified and begin to mingle with the Assyrian occupants. The northern kingdom of Israel would eventually disappear from history permanently, Today, they are known as the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. In fact, in the Gospel, the Samaritans, they come from this group right here. This is why the, the, the traditional Jews of, the time, of, of Jesus' time, they did not like the Samaritans because they believed that they were traitors because they had mingled with the Assyrians and they had, be, they, and they had started other parallel religions and beliefs and so forth. This is why you have this conflict between the Samaritans and the Jews. Okay? Now, are there any dis uh, distinctions between God's people? When you get into the book of Galatians, in chapter 3, verse 28 and 29, it says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen? So when you look at that, that list that John has, the 12,000, okay, that were, that were sealed, the majority of those names did not exist when this was written. So those tribes were not, they, they were not existent. So how could they be sealed? Starting from, so we can start from there. And also here, under the new covenant, there's no distinction. There's no tribes. There's no Jews, Gentiles. We're all one in Christ. We're one in Christ, we are his body, he is the head, okay? So according to the New Testament, there's no distinction, be distinction between us. So, in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, okay, the question would be, how many people does John see standing before the throne after the sealing of the 144,000? Okay, so how many? How many did he see? 
a great number, right? Because this, is, this comes actually right after he mentions those 12,000. It says, after this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. And, and they stood before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. When you look at this word thousand, this word thousand in the, in, in the original language usually refers to a very high number, but that was not, a, that, but that you were not able to literally count. That's why when you go into the records uh, in the Old Testament, the wars that were fought, have you ever noticed that when they, when they, when they, when they mention these wars, they say, well, 38,000 of the, the Assyrians were killed. 26,000, they never say 26,841 they always round it off, okay? Because it was a very large number of people that lost their lives, casualties, but they could not count the number, so they would round off the number. Okay, I don't know exactly how that worked, but this is how the writers in the Bible, when they were inspired to write, this is how they chose um, to record that information, okay? Now, 144,000, if you did not know, is a multiple of 12. How many of you guys are good at math? No one is good. You guys are good at math? Really? Really good? More or less? My son's good at math. He doesn't like to admit it, but he's good at math. He took after his mom. I can't. I, I'm horrible at math. I'm horrible. I, I dread math, okay? But I like, I like math and prophecy, okay? So when you look at the 144,000, this is very interesting. The 144,000 is a multiple of 12. So 12 times 12,000 equals 144,000. Now I'm a math whiz because of that, okay? So, where else do you find the multiples of 12 in the Bible? So when you look in the Bible, the Bible has so many numbers. Okay, you have 10, 7, 3. These are numbers that they, 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 uh, they repeat themselves in the Bible. But the multiple of 12 appears in many places in Scripture. So where else do you find the multiples of 12 in the Bible? So I put a list here. You might find some more. Maybe you, you, can, you can pass that information on to me. Okay, uh, and I can add it to my list. But you have the 12 sons of Jacob, which that's the foundation of the Old Testament church. You have the 12 disciples. Okay, that's the foundation of the New Testament church. You have the 12 showbread in the sanctuary, represents Jesus. Okay, 12 tribes. You have 12 stones on Aaron's breastplate. Those 12 stones represent the 12 tribes of Israel. That represented also that the, the tribes of Israel were close to God's heart. Okay, they were on the breastplate of the, of the priest, okay, the high priest. 24 families were responsible for taking care of the temple service, and they were divided in 24 shifts, okay? Um, that's, that's in the book of Chronicles. This is also interesting. Even the musicians that David, he, that, that he organized to praise and worship God in the temple, okay? It says that there were 288 musicians that were chosen, specially chosen amongst the Levites to praise God, okay? 288, I went, I went to my calculus, I said, it can't be, and it was a multiple of 12, okay? 288, 24 temple guards per shift, 12 baskets of food left over in the miracle, okay, that Jesus performed. The bleeding woman, this is, this is, this right here for me, are, this is one of my favorites. The bleeding woman, okay, um, that she touched, the, the, she, 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 she touched on um, the, say in Portuguese, oh, uh, what is it in English? The hem, there you go. The hem of, uh, 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 of Jesus, and he, she was instantly healed, right? And in that same story, in that same story, you have Jairus' daughter, and she, had, she was how old? She was 12 years old. Now, I want to ask you a question, okay? What makes that story so significant? Why, did, why, was that, why was that written there? Why was that recorded in the Gospels? A woman that suffered with a disease that she was bleeding, okay, continuously for 12 years, and then you have Jairus' daughter, who is 12 years old, and then she dies. And then she's what? Resurrected. Did you ever stop to think about that? Well, let me explain to you what's going on there. Okay, this is really interesting. This is one of my favorite. I, I love this. This is why it's so important to study God's Word, because you find all of these things in there. This woman 
She represents the church in the Old Testament. She was seeking to be healed spiritually, but through the sacrifices of animals, the nonstop shedding of blood, she was never healed. She just had to, she had to cut, keep on going back to the doctors. She, kept on, she had to keep on going back, okay? Once she touched Jesus, the sacrifices ended. Her bleeding stopped. She was healed. The 12-year-old girl represents the church, the New Testament. When Jesus died on the cross, the church died with him. They were discouraged. They were disappointed. That was the first great disappointment because their master had died. But when they found out that he resurrected, the church also what? Resurrected. So that woman represents the church in the Old Testament, and Jairus' daughter represents the church in the New Testament. Number 12, the number 12, the multiple of 12, is associated with the tabernacle, and it's associated with God's church. You see why it's in the Gospels? There's always something there. And of course, you have the 12, the 12 fruits, okay, that uh, serve for the healing of the nations. That's mentioned in Revelation. I think in our lesson this week also mentioned that. Okay? Oh, New Jerusalem. I jumped over New Jerusalem, the church, the 12 foundations, the 12 gates, and so forth. You're going to find multiples of 12 everywhere, okay, within, uh, within the, the framework of, the New, of New Jerusalem. So you see how interesting the number 12 is? The 144,000 is a multiple of 12. It's a number that represents God's church, okay, because 12 is associated with church. Now, did you notice any changes in John's version of the tribal lists? When I read that list, did you notice there were some changes in there? You probably read through it very quickly, but you guys, you, you, noticed the, the, you noticed the changes? What were the changes? Let me see if you know, if you noticed. Did you notice anything there? Huh? Mm, no tribe of Dan, right? He wasn't there, right? All right, let's see. Okay, look, this is the first, this is the original list. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, right? Judah, Zebulun, Issachar, Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Joseph, and Benjamin. These are the 12 sons of Jacob. But then in the book of Numbers, there are some changes. Because remember, the, the Levites, they, were, they, 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 they didn't receive any, they, any inheritance. Okay? Their inheritance was the, te the temple. All right? So they didn't receive any inheritance, so they're taken out of the list. Right? And then Joseph is removed from the list because his two sons now take his place and take the, the place of Levi. That's the, that's the list in, in the book of Numbers. But when you get to the book of Revelations, Dan is missing. Okay, Dan's not there. Um, and also Ephraim. Ephraim. Or Ephraim. I don't know how you guys, I'm, I'm, I have the Portuguese influence there, okay? Ephraim. So, those two are missing. And then you have Levi there. Levi is mentioned in the list. And then Joseph is there. They're not supposed to be there. Okay, so you have this, you have these changes that are made in the list, and the other change, look, who, who does the list start with originally on the first two? It starts with Reuben, okay? But this one starts with Judah, okay? Reuben, he was the oldest, but what did Reuben do in the, to, to his father? Do you remember the story? Yes, so he lost, so he lost that privilege. Okay, he lost that privilege. This is probably one of the reasons why he doesn't start the list, okay, in Revelation. Dan and Ephraim were also very notorious for their apostasy in the Old Testament. That's probably a reason why they're not in that list, okay? Whatever the motives, whatever the reasons are, they can be many. It's very interesting that the list is out of order and those names were removed and those names were replaced. Okay, now... How did the tribes originate? So this is some information here, okay, just in case you're wondering, just in case it's the first time you've seen this information. It says Jacob had two wives and two concubines. The wives were Leah and, uh, and, and uh, Rachel. Then you had the concubines, Zilpah and Billah. Then you had Joseph's wife, okay? And they had their, their sons. Now, after the birth of each child, the wives or midwives recited a blessing to commemorate the mother's pre- and postnatal experience. Every time a child was born, they would say something. They would re recite something, okay? A text, a verse, or something. A blessing, all right? And, and, it's, and you're going to find that in Genesis 29, verses 31 to 35. Genesis 30, verses 1 to 26. Genesis 35 to 17, and 41 to, uh, chapter 41 to verses 15 and 51. Now, 
Why is that important? Why is that interesting? Okay? Remember the questions I asked. Does a study like the 144,000, does it benefit me spiritually? Does it bring me hope? Okay, can this study actually help me through the problems that I'm going through? Well, you know what? I think I believe with all my heart that when you study God's word, it brings you closer to the Lord. Amen. And when you study a subject like this, if, if the Bible says that it's a blessing, it's because it is a blessing. God doesn't lie. He can't lie. He doesn't lie, right? So when we look at this and we analyze and say, well, it's interesting. So why, why that list? Why the 144,000? What can I find in God's word? And this is one of the proofs that I have that God's word was inspired, okay? This is the list right here. This is how it's, this is, this is the list. Okay, that's in Revelation, all right? Now, well, not, not Revelation. That's actually the list, and that's where all those blessings are, are found, okay? Something interesting happens when you recite all the blessings in the same order of the tribal list found in Revelation. Did you know that? When you recite all those blessings in the same order, okay, in the same order, that they are mentioned in the book of Revelation, something interesting happens, all right? Now, before I go to the next slide, some background. When you study the book of Revelation, remember the book of Revelation is, is a war between two great cities, okay? Babylon and Jerusalem. Two great cities are mentioned in the book of Revelation, the study of Revelation. Two women are mentioned, two churches are mentioned and they're struggling against each other, fighting against each other. This is the great controversy, okay? So when you look at what happens here, you're gonna, this is gonna make a lot of sense when you, when, you, when you see what happens when you put those blessings in the same order. When you put them in that same order, you have a prayer of victory. Listen to, l listen to this prayer. Now I will praise the Lord. The Lord has noticed my misery, and now my husband will love me. How fortunate I am. What joy is mine. Now the, other now the other women will celebrate me. I have struggled hard with my sister, and I, am, and I am winning. These are two sisters fighting against each other. Okay? These are two women fighting against each other. God has made me forget my troubles and everyone in my father's house. The Lord heard that I was unloved and has given me another son. Surely this time my husband will feel affection for me since I have given him three sons. God has rewarded me for giving my servant as, as, a, as a wife. God has given me a good reward. Now my husband will treat me with respect for I have given him six sons. God has removed my disgrace. Don't be afraid. You will have another son. God has vindicated me. He has heard my request and given me a son. How many sons is that now? That's seven sons. God has made me fruitful in the land of grief. The question is, are you right now in the land of grief in your life? If you're experiencing right now something in your life that is bringing you down, that is discouraging you, Look to God's word because everywhere in God's word you're going to find a promise. You're going to find, okay, God speaking to you and lifting you up from wherever you are at right now in whatever condition you are facing right now in your life. It says here, he has heard my request and given me a son. He has, God has kept his promise. God has made me fruitful in the, in the land of grief, in grief. If you trust in the Lord, you too will prevail in the land of grief. Are you ready to believe? Amen. Yes. Amen. In the prophecy, prophecy is not only about final events. Prophecy is also about giving God's people hope. Yeah. When John, when he wrote this letter, okay, God's people, they were suffering persecution. This letter was not meant to bring them down, to scare them. It was meant to lift them up and to give them faith. Right now, if we're feeling like we're down and we're discouraged and we feel like everything is not, you know, is not, you know, going our way, if we feel that, man, you know, I have my kids, they're not coming to church, or, you know, or maybe you have someone that, that's in the hospital right now. You don't think they're going to come back from the hospital. God is giving us hope. 
God is telling us that this will not last forever and that he will, he will lift us up in the land of grief. May God bless us and may we have a wonderful and blessed Sabbath. I hope you guys enjoyed the study. And if you guys want the slides, I can send it to you via email. Okay, and you can have all this information for yourself. May God bless you. Amen. Amen.